Okay, we're on chapter 14 tonight, American Sons and the Fifth Commandment. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, thank you that you're here with us in spirit. You said you seek those who will worship you in spirit and in truth. And uh, Lord, as we continue to explore your word, both Old and New Testament, on family, your family plan for all of us and for sons and daughters, just uh, might we be excited about learning your vision for our lives to, uh, to do it and to teach it, as you said, so we'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And uh, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave us the fo formula. You want all of us to be really great in the kingdom of heaven. As you said, if you do these things and teach others also, you will be great. And Lord Jesus, we want to follow your example. Thank you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapter 14, American Sons and the Fifth Commandment. The son of Sir William Penn. William Penn, 1644 to 1718. That was before you were born, James. Or you, Sarah. He was the son of the wealthy and powerful English admiral, Sir William Penn. The son, William Penn, went on to be the founder of the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the great champion of Christian religious freedom in America. In Penn's early days, he suffered greatly for his faith, even being imprisoned in the Tower of London and left to die. But Penn had grown up greatly honoring his father. This gave him great character and wisdom. This gave him the leadership ability to raise up the entire state of Pennsylvania. From early in life, Penn greatly honored his father. At age 22, Penn wrote of his admiral father, quote, I never knew what a father was till I had wisdom enough to prize him. God says he who honors his father, God will bless. And Penn went on to be greatly blessed by God with great wealth and world honor. What about son of Timothy Edwards? Who's the son of Timothy Edwards? The son of Timothy Edwards was Jonathan Edwards, 1703 to 1758, one of the greatest scholars of all American history and one of the greatest preachers in early America. Jonathan Edwards, more than any other American preacher, ignited in the hearts of America's God's moral basis for his civil law and American independence for freedom. Jonathan married when he was 24 years old. He and his wife, Sarah, had 11 children. Jonathan greatly admired his father and went into the same profession with his father. Edwards was not only a preacher, but was widely acknowledged to be America's most important and original philosophers, theologians, and one of America's greatest intellectuals. Before he was 10 years old, he was fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Before he was 10. He entered Yale College at 13 and graduated at 17 as Val Victorian and head of his class. In addition to Edward's regular preaching, he also became president of Princeton College. Jonathan not only honored his father, but his own children and family were known all over the colony for honoring their father, Jonathan, and their mother, Sarah. What was the result of Jonathan Edwards honoring his father to such great degree and Jonathan's children so greatly honoring their father? all in honor of God and his fifth commandment? How did God keep his first commandment with a promise with Jonathan Edwards? Jonathan Edwards highly honored his father and taught his children to do the same towards him. It resulted in an amazing family dynasty of descendants according to A.E. Winship's A Study in Education and Heredity, 1900. He wrote this. Jonathan Edwards' heritage was one vice president of the United States, one comptroller of the United States Treasury, 13 college professor, presidents, 65 professors, 100 lawyers, one dean of law school, 30 judges, one dean of medical school, 56 physicians, 80 holders of public office, three United States senators, three mayors of large American cities, three governors of states, 135 books written by family members, 18 journals and periodicals, 100 becoming overseas missionaries. The same study examined a family known as Jukes. In 1877, while visiting New York's prisons, Richard Dugdale, 
found inmates with 42 different last names, all descending from one man called Max. Born around 1720 of Dutch stock, Max was a hard drinker, idle, irreverent, and not a son that honored his father. Max's dynasty descendants included this, seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 women of debocracy, 130 other convicts, 310 paupers who combined spent 2,300 years in poorhouses, 400 other physically wrecked but indulgent living. The Jukes dynasty descendants cost the state more than 50 million in today's money. Just to compare the two dynasties of a man that honored his father compared to one that did not. What about son of Augustine Washington? Who was that? Oh, you've got that one. Dr. James Kennedy's book, Why the Ten Commandments Matter, he writes, I think of a young man who wanted desperately to join the Navy and see the world. He dreamed of being captain of a ship someday. What a thrill that would be. His mother, however, was not thrilled by the idea of her son, who is just 16, going off to the sea. She walked with him down to the port, and just as he was getting ready to leave, she said to him, Son, I just have no peace about you going off to sea. I have prayed a great deal about this, and I really wish you wouldn't go. What did this young man do? He said to one of the other sailors there, I cannot sail off and break my mother's heart. And he went home with his mother. He never became a captain of a ship, but he did not go on to command an entire navy as President of the United States. The young man was George Washington, who had been taught the Ten Commandments as a child and knew the importance of honoring his father and mother. The son of Augustine Washington was George Washington, 1732 to 1799, the first president of the United States of America. When Washington was called upon to be president of the United States, he departed from his beloved home at Mount Vernon and began his trek towards New York City, stopping first at Fredericksburg, Virginia, to visit his mother, Mary. The last time the two would see each other, his mother Mary was 82 and suffering from incurable breast cancer. Mary parted with her son, giving him her blessings and offering him her prayers. You will see me no more, my great age, and the disease which is rapidly approaching. My vitals wore me out that I shall not be long in this world. Go, George, fulfill the high destinies which heaven appears to assign to you. Go, my son, and may the heavens and your mother's blessing be with you always. George Washington went first to his mother before he took the office, knelt at her feet to get her blessing, as the picture portrays. Washington did go, and he did indeed fulfill the high destinies assigned him by heaven. Throngs of people bowed to Washington, but before George Washington left his mother, he bowed before her while she gave him her final charge and blessing. He did not see his mother after this. The most honorable and greatest men of the world have all greatly honored their parents because God's first commandment with a promise can never fail. What about son of John Adams? The son of John Adams was John Quincy Adams, 1767 to 1848, the sixth president of the United States. Abigail was the mother of John Quincy. Both parents of John Quincy instilled into their son a deep fear and reverence for God and his Ten Commandments. John Quincy grew up deeply honoring both his father and mother. All these men knew the Ten Commandments by memory when they were young, young boys. When John was 12 years old, he began a diary that he kept until just before he died. Much of Adam's youth was spent accompanying his father overseas. John Adams served as an American envoy to France, bringing his young son John Quincy with him when he was only 11 years old and a year later to the Netherlands with his father until he was 14. Then at 14 and for nearly three years, John Quincy accompanied Francis Dana as a secretary to him and the United States to St. Petersburg, Russia to obtain recognition of the new United States. Mind you, at 14, he was the secretary to the ambassador to Russia. During these years of overseas, young Adams gained a mastery of French and Dutch and a familiarity with German and other European languages. George Washington appointed John Quincy minister to the Netherlands at the age of 26. And two years later, as minister to Portugal. 
Washington even then promoted young John to the Berlin leg legation. John Quincy was enormously blessed by God. As always, God keeps his first commandment with promise to all those who honor their parents. And you'll see why John Quincy qualified before God. Look at his letter he wrote to his father at nine years of age. Braintree, June 2, 1777. Dear Sir, I love to receive letters very well, much better than I love to write them. Remember, he's nine years old, writing this to his father. I make but a poor figure at composition. My head is much too fickle. My thoughts are running after birds' eggs, play, and trifles, till I get vexed with myself. Mama has a troublesome task to keep me a studying. I owe, own I am ashamed of myself. I have but just entered the third volume of Rollins' History, which is an enormous volume, but designed to have got half through it by this time. I'm determined this week to be more diligent. Mr. Thaxter is absent at court. I have set myself a stint to read the third volume half out. If I can but keep my resolution, I may again at the end of the week give a better account of myself. I wish, sir, you would give me, in writing, some instructions with regard to the use of my time, and advise me how to proportion my studies and play, and I will keep them by me and endeavor to follow them. With the present determination of growing better, I am, dear sir, your son, John Quincy Adams. P.S. Sir, if you will be so good as to favor me with a blank book, I will transcribe the most remarkable passages I meet with in my reading, which will serve to fix them upon my mind. The Life of John Quincy Adams by William Seward. What is unique about all these sons that honored their father in early American history? What do you think? What is unique about all these sons that greatly honored Every one of them, yeah. What was the one thing the greatest Jewish leader, Moses, and the greatest American leader, George Washington, had in common regarding, er regarding parents? What specifically? What do you think? Remember when we went over Moses? And they both bowed down. They bowed down to their parents. And they didn't lift a finger until they got the blessing. Yeah, didn't lift a finger until they got the blessing. They bowed down in front of everybody. Moses, uh, I'm, I'm sure the, the three to five million people were seeing him, the head of the whole nation, go and bow down to this Bedouin man who was his father. And George Washington did the same thing to his mother. What things does a father do that and mind you, we say, well, that was, their that was not their culture. That was not, <laughs> no king ever bowed down from other nations except those that were of God. Obama. Pardon me? And, Obama. and what? Obama. Except and Obama. Obama. And Obama. And Hitler. Obama bowed down to the, the Oh, Obama, yeah, he bowed down to the to the king. I don't know if he's bowed down to his mother, but maybe so. But all these men, I mean, just, just, just realize, say, well, that was then. I wouldn't do that. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting you need to do that, but it wouldn't be wrong, it says in Proverbs, to rise up before your mother. Uh, you, you need to be overt. The, these men were overt. It, it, they weren't embarrassed. It was, it, it was absurd what they did. They were overt. They didn't care what anybody else thought to their father, to their mother. Both who, by the way, were godly. What things does a father, both their parents, I might add, was I, what I was trying to say is their, the mother was a godly woman and uh, Moses' father was a godly father. What things does a father do that may keep a son from wanting to give his heart to his father? What things does a father do that may keep a son from wanting to give his heart to his father. 
That's a good question. Can't remember myself. <laughs> what do you think? What things does a father do that may keep a son from wanting to give his heart to his father? Exasperate him, yes, that would be right. I had something in mind when I wrote it, and I can't remember what I wrote it because it's in the context. Every one of these questions is in the context. Yeah. You know. I was thinking maybe the fa- I don't want him to bring the story about maybe the father doesn't give the child his heart. His father he didn't do his father thing, whether it's good or bad. Well that's true. That would be definitely true, wouldn't it? <laughs> he says in, in Malachi, the last verse verses in the Old Testament, to uh, fathers give your hearts to your children, and children give your hearts to your father. Oh, Jukes, Max Jukes. Yeah, what things does a father do that may keep a son from wanting to give his heart to his father? Not being a righteous, godly man. Apart from any lack of the father, why may a son not want to give his heart to his father? Apart from any lack of the father, what may a son not want to give his heart to his father? Society, that's good, yeah. But God says don't be conformed to this world, society. Yeah. What else? There's some more thoughts on this. Siblings. siblings? Other siblings not giving their hearts? So you want to be like your siblings, yeah. What others think? Society or others in your family? Yeah, your brothers and sisters. You bet. I would stubbornness. stubbornness, yeah. Yeah, you know, not really not believing. Really, I think not believing God's promise. I mean, if you really believe God's promise, it, it's as simple as that. Can and should a son give his heart to his father regardless of how his father is? What do you think? Yes, yes. It doesn't mean, you know, some have had very unrighteous fathers. So it doesn't mean we follow the unrighteousness of any man, including a father. But um, whatever way we can, we should give our heart to our our father and what the Lord would do through our father. And the Lord leads through non-Christian. Caiaphas, who was a part of the the godless that had Jesus crucified, actually prophesied the truth, didn't he? So even God has ordained all of our fathers for our good. Number six, or here's the memory verse. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Oh, my son, give me your heart, and may your eyes take delight in following my ways. You know, for years I read that verse, and I always thought of it with the Lord. And that, that is not wrong to think of it that way. The Lord wants us to certainly give our hearts to the Lord. But the context is not talking about giving our hearts to the Lord. This is, and, and it's not the son saying this. Now see, this is kind of interesting. The father says to the son, son, give me your heart. May your eyes take delight in following my ways. So fathers, you need to pray about being worthy of saying this and then saying this to Our sons, I have said this to my sons. Oh, my son, give me your heart, and may your eyes take delight in following my ways. And I want to tell you, that makes me want to be sure I'm following the ways of the Lord. So that's a great verse to remember. That's what God wants, Proverbs 23, 26. Lord, help us, I pray. Now, this is chapter 15. Sons violating. Now let's look at the opposite. Sons that violate the fifth commandment. Noah's son. Noah had three adult married sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. As married adult sons, God still held them accountable for honoring their father in every way. Notice, as married adult sons. These men were all married. They were were adults. 
God still held them accountable for honoring their father in every way, even after they're married. And you'll see it right now. But after the flood, their father Noah greatly sinned. After the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked inside his tent. And by the way, the Hebrew word, laying naked, it, 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 it expresses a real vileness that was expressed there. It wasn't just laying naked, it was a real vileness. Ham, the father of Kenan, saw his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. Then Sham and Japheth took a robe, held it over their shoulders, and backed into the tent to cover their father. As they did this, they looked the other way so they would not see him naked. They wouldn't see his vileness. When Noah woke up from his stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. Then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Then Noah said, May the Lord, the God of Sham, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant. May God expand the territory of Japheth. May Japheth share the prosperity of Sham, and may Canaan be his servant. Noah lived another 350 years after the great flood. He lived 950 years and then he died. Genesis 9, 20 through 28. At this time, Noah got drunk and was lying naked inside his tent. He was a detestable example as a father. Know what I've said there? He was a detestable example as a father. His son Ham saw his father in sin and went out and told his other brothers. His other brothers took a robe and walked in backwards, dropping it over their father, refusing to even see their father in sin. Ham exposed his father's sin to others. Even though what Ham said was true, it dishonored his father. Sham and Japheth said nothing and even covered over their father's sin. God's greatest test and opportunity for a son or daughter to honor their father or mother may be when they actually see their father or mother in sin. God's greatest test and opportunity for a son or daughter to honor their father or mother may be when they actually see their father or mother in sin. The way Shem and Japheth responded to their father's sin is exactly how God responds. Shem and Japheth said nothing, would not look at it, and even covered it so no one else could see it. That is consistent with God himself. Doesn't God say, I will bury your sins in the deepest sea? I will not remember your sins anymore. After this, there was no mention nor any commendation of Noah's sin by God. God never made reference to Noah's sin or judgment. Just as Sham and Japheth covered their father's sin, even so God says love covers a multitude of sin, 1 Peter 4, 8. Just as Sham and Japheth would not see their father's sin, even so God says I will never remember their sins, Hebrews 8, 12 and 10, 17. More amazing, the father that actually sinned was the very one that God used to curse Ham, the son's progeny dynasty. Ham slandered his father. To slander anyone is wicked. But for a son or daughter to slander their father, whether what they say is true or not, always deserves death, according to God, in both the Old and New Testament. From creation even until today, We'll see some of those verses later, both in the Old and New Testament. It is seen here with Noah before God even gave His law to Moses. Jesus said the same in both Matthew 15 and Mark 7, and the Apostle Paul even reaffirmed it again in Romans 1. In both these places, it says if you speak 
ill will towards your father. Jesus said twice in the gospel, you should be put to death. Paul said in Romans 1, you should be put to death. A father's curse is essentially a death sentence. Ham's son was Canaan, and his descendants were the who? The Canaanites, that God later told Moses, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Canaanites, so you may live there, and I will destroy them completely. Exodus 23, 23. Today there are descendants of Shem and Jepheth living in the land of Israel today. But there is not one living Canaanite left on the face of the earth. To not honor a father, even a father that has sinned, is to receive God's death curse instead of honoring our father and mother and relishing in God's first commandment with a promise. I think there's so much just to meditate on Noah and his sons. It would revolutionize our lives to know God's attitude. Isaac's sons. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. In the words of the scriptures, I loved Jacob, but I rejected Esau, Romans 9, 13. Many translations say, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. But the real question is, why? It seems God had the exact same attitude towards Esau as Esau had towards his father. Esau rejected his father. He rejected his father in three ways. Esau did not, it's kind of interesting, I had a little mailbox there. I don't know what that's there for. There, we took care of that mailbox. Esau did not honor his father by not honoring the birthright of his father. Esau honored his physical desires and appetite more than the birthright of his father. It could be honoring money, wanting physical things, more than the honor of the father. But Jacob greatly honored his father and exchanged his very food to inherit his father's birthright. So he exchanged what was valuable to have what was more valuable, the birthright, in Genesis chapter 25, 29 through 34. Esau did not honor his parents. Oh, I know what this is. This is numbers. That's what it is. But somehow... It got into a mailbox, which is kind of interesting, isn't it, how these little things do that? Whoops. Here's how, here's how we do it, gang. We do it one. There we go. How about that? All it takes is a little bit of tenacity. One. And then here we'll do this like this. So you'll see a little bit of self-editing, too. Esau did not honor his parents by independently choosing who he would marry. This is so common in our culture, it's not biblical. He married who he wanted to, contrary to what his parents wanted. Genesis 26, 34 through 35, and Genesis 27, 46. But Jacob followed the direction of his parents in exactly who he should marry. Genesis 28, 1 through 2. They gave the direction for him. Even though he had to wait, and it cost him 14 years of his life, Genesis 29, 18, 30, before he finally could have his wife and leave back to the, his homeland. Number three, these mailboxes are something else, aren't they? Esau did not live near his father or care for him in any way. He only thought of himself. Jacob honored his father and mother because he always obeyed them doing exactly what they told him to do. Now, my son Jacob, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you, Genesis 27, 8 and 43. And Jacob always did. Even, and even Esau also knew that Jacob had obeyed his parents. Genesis 28, 7. The last prophet in the Old Testament wrote, This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi. I have always loved you, says the Lord. But you retort, Really? How have you loved us? Think of this now. How have you loved us? And the Lord replies, This is how I showed my love for you. I loved your ancestor Jacob, but I rejected his brother Esau and devastated his hill country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert for jackals. Those who honor their parents, God will honor. Those who dishonor their parents, God will see to it that they are rejected. Esau's descendants in Edom may say, 
We have been shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. But the Lord of the heaven's army replies, They may try to rebuild, but I will demolish them again. Their country will be known as the land of wickedness, and their people will be called the people with whom the Lord is forever angry. When you see the destruction for yourselves, you will say, Truly, the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. Malachi 1 1 through 5. Those people with whom the Lord is forever angry are people like Esau who do not honor God, reflected in not honoring their father and mother. And truly, this is not just for Israel. Truly, the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. That's the context. It reaches to every son and daughter on the face of the earth today. In fact, the last verses in that book, which are the last verses in the Bible, is the one that says God will destroy even a nation where the sons don't honor their father. As our country is being destroyed because sons are not honoring their father. Jacob's son. Jacob had 12 sons, but one son, Judah, decided to leave his father and go off and do his own independent thing, like every good American boy. Then look, what it, look at what happened, all in Genesis 38. Number one, he moved to a place that was not good, Adullam. He moved in with a guy that was not good, Hara. Then he married a woman that was not good. Then he had a wicked son, Ur, that was so evil, the Lord took his life. Then he had another wicked son, Onan, who was so evil that the Lord took Onan's life too. Then his wife died. And finally, he ended up with a prostitute. That's all in that one chapter when he left his father independently. Everyone who dishonors their father may not have this life story, but they will have a life story that is not good. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But if you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you and you will have a long life on the earth. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 and Ephesians 6, verse 3. Eli's sons. Now, the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord. Now, Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing. Eli said to them, why do you keep sinning? You must stop my sons. But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father. For the Lord was already planning to put them to death. The time is coming when I will put an end to your family. They will die a violent death. And to prove that what I have said will come true, I will curse your two sons, Hopani and Phinehas, to die on the same day. The ark of God was captured in Hopani and uh, Phinehas, I guess the two sons of Eli, they were killed, 1 Samuel 2, 12 and 22, 5 and 31 through 34 and 4, 11. Everyone who dishonors their father may not have this life story either, but they will have a life story that is not good. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps whatever he sows. David's sons. King David was far from a perfect father in many ways. He had committed murder. He had committed adultery. Whoops. He committed murder. He committed adultery. He persisted in lying and deception for a time in his life. David's sin were so egregious, egregious that he resulted in plagues, killing thousands of Israelites. David was not what you would call an ideal father, to say the least. But David had 19 sons. And each of their destinies totally related to one thing, whether they honored or dishonored their father. Now let's see. Two of David's sons, Absalom and Agenai, both dishonored their father, openly rebelling against him. Both of them died very young, violent deaths. Fourteen of David's sons more quietly dishonored their father. They did not stand in defense of their father. They were passively dishonoring their father. Quietly, they didn't defend their father. And against their siblings, they did not defend their father against their siblings when their siblings rebelled against their father. In doing this, after aligning with their rebellious brothers, all 14 of these sons were never heard from again. 
They left only one, that left only one other son of David's. This one and only son of David truly honored his father. Time and again, everyone referred to him as his father's servant. 1 Kings 1.19 and 1 Kings 1.26. As his father's servant. So it was this one son that got his father's blessing. And he was Solomon. It was God who then honored David's one son, Solomon, the one son who honored his father. And what did God do for him? God gave David's son, Solomon, a long life to be the wisest man on earth and the wealthiest man on earth and to be the greatest king of any nation on the earth. Of David's 19 sons, 18 were cursed because they did not honor their father. Only one honored his father and only one was greatly blessed by God. Jesus' warning for any son or daughter today that violates God's fifth commandment. Jesus replied, Why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commands of God? For instance, God says, Honor your father and mother. Anyone who speaks disrespectfully of a father or a mother must be put to death. Notice that's what Jesus said. Jesus, they weren't even asking him about it. He took the initiative to bring this up. But you say, it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you today, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you are saying they don't need to honor their parents. Notice, honoring parents here is in two ways. One, in what you speak, and two, in what you do. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents, and so you cancel the Word of God. If you don't honor your parents, you're canceling the whole Word of God. Not a verse, not this verse, the whole Word of God. For the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their what? Lips. They sing songs and music, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as, as commands from God, Matthew 15, 9. Number two, Jesus said it a little different in the Gospel of Mark, but God thought it important enough to repeat it again, so we should repeat it also. Jesus replied, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. For instance, Moses gave this law from God, honor your father and mother. Anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give to God. You'd think, my goodness, shouldn't God be ahead of your father? But God knows you're putting God first when those on earth he's prioritized who you should put first, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way you let them disregard their needy parents, and so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tra tradition. Mark 7, 6 through 13. The Apostle Paul warns against any son or daughter violating God's commandment. It's not just the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. They disobey their parents. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, Romans 1, 30 through 32. They disobey their parents. These aren't children. These are adults. They know God's justice requires that those who do those things deserve to die. The next verse is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Disobedient to their parents and ungrateful they may even act religious, but stay away from people like that. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Who you're with is the first most important way to be godly. We were sharing with some just the other day where God says you'll be prepared for every good work if you cleanse yourself from those Christians that are like wood or, or dishonorable versus uh, being with those that are honorable. Just who you associate will determine more than, more than anything else God being able to use you. If you read the whole context there in 2 Timothy, you'll see that. Okay, here's the questions. What will you remember about Noah's sons? 
Guys, what are you going to remember about Noah's sons? What do you think? James? Or Madison? Or Sarah? What do you remember about Noah's sons? Or any one of you? What do you think of when you think of Noah's sons? What's that? Yeah. The other two were blessed for not disowning Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's really amazing, isn't it, that he was in sin. You'd have thought, you know, uh, to me that's just an incredible story. Anybody have any thoughts more on that? It's How did he dishonor? To uncover yeah. his nakedness is usually to, to lay with. You know how he dishonored him? Remember? You weren't, you weren't here. What, how, did, how did he dishonor his father? But it says to uncover. How did, how did he dishonor? You asked the question, I'll listen for the answer. How did he dishonor his father? He told his brothers. He looked himself. He repeated it. It was true, wasn't it? To his brothers. And they got and his family got cursed and all of them died. They were the Canaanites. So I thought it said it uncovered his dad's nakedness, which is tough. No, they the two sons went and covered their father up. He had gotten drunk and one that sinned uncovered his dad's nakedness. No, no, that isn't right. He didn't uncover him. He was already uncovered. He went in and saw that he was naked. You, you, you weren't here. You missed the beginning of that. Number two, what will you remember about Isaiah, Isaiah's sons? Or Isaac's sons? Yeah, what, what, do you, what do you remember? What's distinct about that? What do you, you know, there's a lot of things, but what, what kind of impressed you? What specifically do you remember about his two sons, Isaac's sons? Yeah. Later on, even a third. That's right. He continued to marry women that his mother, especially, and his father did not want or did not like. And said they, they, they were not happy. He didn't, not only did not get their permission, he just went off and did what he wanted to do. And he wasn't blessed, to say the least. In fact, he was cursed. Yeah. But just the opposite was true with uh, Jacob. God really blessed him. What do you remember about Jacob's son? What do you remember about Jacob's son? Did I get that right? Yeah. I don't think we looked into Jacob's son. Oh, that's right, John 28, yeah. That was, okay, yeah. That was all the problems he ran into because he left his father. He was independent. Remember that? All the things that happened to him. He, he, he went to a country where he shouldn't have gone. He went to a place he shouldn't have gone. He had a friend he shouldn't have had. He married a woman he shouldn't have married. He had a son that was bad. God killed the son. He got another son. God killed him. He was bad. Then God finally killed his wife, and he finally ended up with a prostitute. Yeah, he didn't do too good, did he? Yeah, it was, yeah. It is. It shows the grace of God, but, but he really sinned and independ because of his independent action. I don't know, later maybe he repented. He had to have repented, and I've looked at that, I don't know how many times, but you know, it's when uh, with Joseph, he's the chief spokesman, and he takes the responsibility. Uh, Judah. And, and so later on, when Jacob was dying, he, he says, you know, Judah's a, a lion's wealth or whatever that is. A lion's so he really wealth. repented, didn't he? He really repented. He was, that's, that's, good. that's the most encouraging. That's encouraging, too. So no matter how rebellious we are, we can always change. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, you remember about Eli's sons. <coughs> Not good. <laughs> Not good. They didn't father their father's instruction, and they both died on the same day prematurely. Remember about David's sons. How many sons did David have? 
How many? How many? Nineteen. Yeah. And what happened to 18 of them? They disappeared, yeah. Well, two of them died violent deaths. And the other sons that passively condoned their rebellion, they didn't publicly condemn their father. They just kind of, they didn't reject their sons. Solomon rejected them getting together. Those that joined them just quietly, they eventually just kind of dissipated and disappeared. You don't hear anything about them. The only one you hear about was Solomon, who did not join the other siblings, the other sons. And God, of course, made him the wisest and wealthiest man in the world. What we remember about Jesus' warning for any son or daughter today that ignores God's fifth commandment? Huh? That's a heavy-duty one, isn't it? Yep, they should, Jesus said they should be put to death. That's what Jesus said. Well, we remember about Paul's warning for any son or daughter today that ignores God's fifth commandment. He said they should be put to death in Romans 1, but the church does not carry the sword. So that's why in 2 Timothy it says any that are disobedient to their parents, to the church, Paul didn't tell Timothy to put him to death because the church is not to do that. But it said, in essence, you're to excommunicate them because it says shun them, stay away from them. Can you imagine that? Rebellious sons that aren't honoring their father in church, in a Christian fellowship, they should be put out, they should be shunned, they should be turned away. That's, in a sense, the death sentence. Each, each institution has a form of discipline or death. The form of discipline for the church is, is shunning or excommunicating or putting out. The form of discipline for parents is, is the rod. It says, don't use the rod sparingly if you love your sons or daughters. And the, and the form of discipline for the state, of course, is the sword. It says in Romans 13, they don't carry the sword in vain. So Paul says in Romans 1, they're worthy of death. But to the church, to Timothy, he said, you just have them as good as dead. You don't be with them anymore. So don't be with sons or daughters that are disobedient to their parents. Here's the memory verse. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Disobedient to their parents and ungrateful, they may even act religious, but stay away from people like that. Isn't that interesting? Disobedient, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, says they're disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They may even act religious, but stay away from people like that. Let's pray. God, I just ask you to have us realize you've given us this instruction so we can have life and health, so we can live a long life and a good life and a, and a life full. And just uh, so many times we think, hey, we've, uh, to have a good life, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. But you've made promises how we'll have a good life if we do this and if we do that. Lord, we know it's not wrong to get educated and go to college or school or, or study or, or get careers, but Lord, you've made promises that have nothing to do with those things that guarantee a long life and a good life. Help us to give certainly more energy, more commitment to what you, God of the universe, promises than to what the world goes after to live a long life and to live a good life. Because God, somehow, some way, your word will never return void. You said, don't be deceived. You will not be mocked. Whatever we sow, we'll reap. Whether it's good or bad, to the flesh, we'll reap destruction. To the spirit, doing what you say, we'll reap life. And we know the word life there doesn't mean existence, but it means life of abundance and zest and zeal and fullness. Thank you for giving us the key the most fundamental key for all of our lives to live long and good. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, any questions or comments that some of you may have?